getting to meet parents around the state, uh, community leaders, teachers. You, you see our state. We, we've got tight-knit families. Right. We have traditional values. We understand the importance of families. Um, we should be a leader. We should be doing this for our own citizens, right? But but also the, the nation needs this. They right. need they need the the return to family values and the, and to strengthen families. So it's it's a uh, it's something we should be doing, and it's exciting to be a part of the work. I agree, and I really believe I'm on a prophetic level, but also just in in the natural and everything that Oklahoma is going to be the city on a hill for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. The example that people look for for a lot of things, and I really think that the kingdom of God is going to be doing things through Tulsa, through Oklahoma, and Absolutely. stuff like that. I know that's been something that people in ministry and in the world have been hearing about for a long time, and I really think we're in that place and time where we're going to start see it coming in, into fruition. I agree, and you know, you and I have had these conversations now for for probably what two years now, just about you know, here in Oklahoma, when I say, you know, we have Christians that are teachers, and we have a Christian community that are embracing the school and the students. Around. Hey, in Oklahoma, we love that. Yeah, you know, that that's something that we embrace. Right. We understand the importance of it. You know, I think other states have really lost their way with it, but here right. in Oklahoma, we say, listen, the church wants to step in and help. You know, you've you've heard me talk about that not only with our public schools, but also private schools, yeah. and also what that can look like in the future. But. And it, that's been a value, and that really was the ideology for a long time with us as a nation. But as we grew, it's interesting to see how the map laid out for things, and in the middle became a little more conservative, and it, mm -hmm. and all the uh, you know all the states at the coasts and stuff seemed to become more liberal, and mm -hmm. how this these communities and these pockets develop, and th that's why we try to think about how maybe we. Want to be cautious about how many Californians <laughs> come sure. into come into sure. Oklahoma. Of course, we want people to want to come here, but for the right reasons, and right. not turning us into a purple state or something worse than that. But yeah, uh, staying true to Oklahoma values—that is something that we'll have to continue to fight for. Yeah, you know, and I think that it's it's you know similar as what we're talking about as a state is what we should be doing as a country, right? You, right. you bring people in, but you bring them into what your core principles are. What, what's your what's your what's made you great as a country? Well, right. same way as a state. You know, do we want conservatives, traditionally minded folks, to move into the state? Yes. Yeah. But hey, if you're going to come into our state, don't come in with these blue state values. Don't come in and not believing in the strength of the family of the the nation and the principles we're founded on. But come in and say, look, we are coming into this way of life where we are folks that believe in what you're doing in Oklahoma. And so again, we need to be really clear though first with with who we are. What are, what are our core principles? What do we believe in? And I think that, that that's how you, you lead the people who live there, but it's also how you send a clear message. So look, if, if you move into the state, this, this is what we're about here. And if we market it like that, then we would ideally be drawing those people to it for that reason. I mean, just like I don't particularly have any desire to move to California because right? of how sure. they marketed themselves, sure. you know. Yeah, great weather, but what we're moving into is going to be a lot more than the weather, I'll right? I'll take Florida. Yeah, that's yeah. right. You do a lot of interviews, and we get straight to the point with some things, but I really like to kind of also highlight the humanity of the person that we're talking to. So if you could just, I think it'd be cool if you just told us about your own upbringing as a child, your own education and the family you grew up in, and then transferring into your own family now. Yeah, you know, um, Growing up, I was really close with, with my mom and my dad. Um, my dad was always a, a preacher on the weekends. He was a banker, but he, but he preached on the weekends. So we would travel around with him as he would preach. My mom was a teacher. Uh, I was very close with my grandparents. My grandfather and I spent a lot of time together growing up. He's a retired Navy uh, guy. He was a, a chief petty officer in the Navy. So we talked a lot about politics, history, life, family. And him and I were really close. And so, you know, growing up, it was always, for me, really exciting of, I loved school. Uh, I loved my teachers. I, I loved my friends at school. I got really into history uh, yeah. in uh, you know junior high and high school. And so for me, when I came home and wanted to talk about history, my grandpa always would do that. We'd talk for hours. My dad would. And when I came home and said, hey, I want to be a teacher, oh, they were all excited. I mean, they were all, hey, that's what you love to do. You, you talk about it all the time. You love working you know, with your teachers at school. You'll be great. And so they were always very encouraging uh, of me. And so for me growing up, I had that, that family close with my brother and sister, went off to college, but, but I was one of those kids that, I mean, I was probably 11 or 12 when I went home, I was like, hey, I wanna be a teacher. Yeah. And I really never, uh, that's what I wanted to do. And so it was a great upbringing in, in a McAllister small town. Uh, so really enjoyed uh, growing up there and my, my family. And uh, So Oklahoma born and raised. Oh yeah, yeah. That's yeah. interesting, because it's kind of the opposite story of mine. I, I was like, 
I struggled through education. I was mm. bullied fourth grade all the way to senior year. I almost dropped out of high school. Broken Arrow High School, if you miss 10 days in a semester, you failed. I missed nine and a half. I really oh. pushed the limit on oh, that. Wow. But I just had sort of kind of a negative experience. But really sprinkled throughout it, I had things that now I can look back and see that kind of kept me going and opportunities. I, 10th grade, I had a really great English teacher, mm -hmm. uh, Brie Oberdick. And uh, yeah, <laughs> she yeah. um, really uh, just was very like, very nurturing in that way that mm -hmm. it was necessary to be in, but also very good with her materials and the way that she sure. delivered and the way that she handled conflict. So that modeled something that I needed. And, you know, I think God sure. knew, knows what we need along the way yep. to get us to where we need to be. And then I had another great teacher when I did Tulsa Tech program in high school. Mm -hmm. And so that stuff kind of sustained me, you know, for a little bit because I was really like pushing the limits on some things with education before. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Long story short, lo and behold, fast forward, and I'm a teacher now. But I think that that experience, so sure. whether positive or negative, yeah. the idea of things can all be worked out for good and for a purpose goes both ways. So on when that. did that hook get for for you? Where you where you were like, I, I want to be a teacher. Education. Okay, so uh, this, I went on a mission trip to Haiti. My parents, okay. they went on a mission trip to Haiti when they were young, and we were just little kids, and we would always see these pictures of it, mm -hmm. and so it was just kind of in the back of my mind. And my parents have always been kind of live a life of service and mm -hmm. in the community and open doors and stuff like that. And so I think that so sparked something inside of me at a young age. And so I got into a nonprofit, education nonprofit that had just moved to Tulsa, mm -hmm. national program. You could get into this program and you could start working in the classroom as long as you were 17 and graduated high school. Mm -hmm. But you had to peer, be paired with a teacher that was certified. And so I did that and I built relationships with students and I really started to address and tackle the things and the wounds inside of me for my own education, mm -hmm. I started to attack them head on with the opposite of what the negative things that happened to me will infiltrate the opposite of that into these students. So the mm -hmm. positive side, what mm -hmm. would be the polar opposite of the ne negative thing that I experienced? How can I transfer that for good for these students? And I realized that this was really an opportunity to platform for service and to serve the community and to do something that I was so afraid of this mountain of education that mm -hmm. terrified me to climb that mountain. And, and so I ended up doing that. Then I was like, well, now I don't have a degree and now I love teaching. <laughs> and so I went out and got my bachelor's degree, worked in the classroom all through college, mm -hmm. was a TA. I wanted to keep my resume going, yep. make it easy to get a teaching job, taught TA here in Edmond. Uh, went to UCO for a short minute, transferred a few times, had some tragedies happen in my family that caused me to go back to Tulsa. And then I ended up in the classroom. So long story short, you know, <laughs> I ended up getting into something that I was terrified of mm -hmm. and God really turned it around and used that for a purpose. But I think it's interesting when you look at someone's journey and how mm -hmm. they get somewhere, yep. as long as you're finding someone who will answer the call and be obedient to that. That's right. Funny, the first time I ever met you, we were at an event and you got up and you started talking about, you know, you had some questions, but you really kind of contextualized so many of the key issues in education and just listening to you talk and your passion for kids and, and how you viewed the teaching profession and schools and education, it was just obvious to me that it was you, know, you were meant to be engaged in education. You are meant to be involved in it. Right, so. and that's an interesting story we, I mentioned before, too, because it was like I was late to the game when you were campaigning, and my eyes were really open to education through that period, but then I, I had just moved back to Oklahoma, and I was like, I'm going to stay. Like, I love Oklahoma. I grew up here. I moved away for two years. Mm -hmm. I was a nanny in Florida during COVID craziness, mm -hmm. got fired from that for not being Sorry, I'm probably going to trigger the video on here for, <laughs> for yeah. all social media. Yeah. We can cut that part out if we need to. But <laughs> took a job in Arizona, better pay for a teacher. And then I came back and visited on the holidays. I was like, I think I'm in love with Tulsa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so yeah. I decided uh, like my heart was here and I felt called to come back and uh, here to stay. Bought a house, got into Tulsa Public Schools. So this would technically be my third year working in Tulsa Public Schools, mm -hmm. but first year directly as a TPS mm -hmm. employee. And so I love the vision and the mission there. I did end up moving on to a different school for a little more pay, but I decided to stay still invested with Tulsa Public mm -hmm. Schools and the community, going to board mm -hmm. meetings, getting into launching the Association of Christian Teachers and things yes. like this. Ways to keep going with that because I, I fell in love with the city mm -hmm. and I fell in love yep. with the state of Oklahoma. So yep. that's, as far as I'm concerned, in whatever way that looks like, that's all the students in Oklahoma. Yep. So then we branch into media and how can we cast the net wide. I can be very laser focused in the classroom, mm -hmm. but then also things on a larger scope, we can do things with media that 
work right. with Oklahoma. So the Oklahoma Lion Podcast, like we're right. talking here now for, and connecting and networking with other groups who are like-minded. The Steamboat Institute mm -hmm. out of Colorado will use this video for them as well. But just kind of watching the opportunities unfold when you've taken the step of obedience, you know, and I think that we've we've seen that when you answer the call, we've seen that when other leaders step in. Elena Ashley, Tulsa Public Schools, yep. saw a need and decided to respond to it. And I think that's important. And then the opportunities come to you because my perspective on that is God sees an obedient servant who would then say yes to the next thing. Right. And you're kind of training yourself in that way, Absolutely. in your mind and in your spirit in that way. And I think that's important. But I think that let's have you talk a little bit about we had someone come down and do some interviews with some of us here in Tulsa and, you know, kind of connecting with you guys in Oklahoma City and stuff like that. So Prager University, mm -hmm. Prager U is a media group and they've launched into education mm -hmm. and they launched into advocacy and different aspects of news and current events and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But Oklahoma specifically, tell to us what that looks like for Oklahoma now and why you decided that was a good idea to do yeah, you know, one of the things that I, when I look at education, I look at how can Oklahoma be a leader? How can we really push back on the left-wing ideology in schools? And how can we present our kids history, English, math in a way that really makes them think and really sets the bar high? And one of the things we've always looked at is when understanding American history, how do you really get kids engaged and excited about it and then understand it well, right? And I, from the moment I started looking at PragerU a few years ago, when I was in the classroom, I said, you know, look, they've got videos here that really get your attention mm -hmm. if you're a young person. And then they really start lay layering in quotes and facts. And, and it's really that, that uh, blending of entertainment and education that really is, a, it's tough. It's a tough little line to right. walk. And they do a really good job with it. So we wanted to be the first state in the country to launch all of their courses from all the way down to the youngest kids and make it available for all Oklahoma students because what we saw was, well, you look at these videos for these young kids, it gets them excited about George Washington, right. Abraham Lincoln, it makes them want to learn more. So I love how they do that with the early grades and the earlier and then the later grades. They really challenge you of, here's some quotes from Thomas Jefferson. Here's the context and the time he lived. So, so why did he believe that way? What, what was his thought process here? How was he influenced by those around him? And I really loved how they did that. Again, it's fact, it's primary sources. And it's really pushing students to really do a deep dive in history. And so, you know, we, we have absolutely loved the partnership with them. I love how they um, really get out there and really go out and talk about what they're doing. Yeah. So I love their social media um, aspect of what they do as well, because you see, they, they just, the content is all there. Right. So parents can go online and see it. Teachers can go online and see it. They're, they're, there's nothing that they're hiding from parents. Right. And so we've really loved uh, the partnership with them and, and continue to talk about ways to get them in more uh, uh, classrooms across the state. And one thing I would highlight about Prager University specifically, they are transparent with things and they aren't afraid to face the opposition and try to engage them in a conversation. Yeah, so right. even outside of the kids' content, like the, the influencers that I follow with PragerU, Am Amalani, she goes to the universities and is yep. willing to have the conversation with people. And another thing I noticed with some of the videos I even showed to my students, they were highlighting pieces of history that we don't hear mainstream right. in the classroom. Yep. And it was controversial with my last interview we did. I'm not going to name the media group or anything, but the reason it was controversial and the reason that it didn't sit well with some people is like, well, I wonder because we're not talking about this part right. so much yep. anymore. We're not talking about the fact that slavery is something that has gone on since the beginning in time all yep. over the world and still happens today through the form of human trafficking and the way that slavery maybe looked in the past, still in other underdeveloped countries, like or yeah. even other more modern countries, we're really seeing this video that I had showed in particular with Candace Owens where she gave a brief history on slavery. Well, the pushback from that was, this is not giving the broad scope and the reality of American slavery. And I said, no, I would not show this video and let it be the, the whole of my lesson. This is yep. something you supplement and you put in That's right. in the middle or on the end because it is touching on a part we never talk about. Yeah. So, and that's what, you know, and, and, and people try to do that and, and take it out as, well, look, you know, there's other things to talk about other than just the things. That, right. And I go, well, yeah, they're, they're 10 minute videos. Like, yeah. they're, they're, there's more going on. But I think PragerU does a great job of, like you said, going in and saying, we want students to have a holistic picture. So we give good context, and we also really talk about parts of history that, that you might not be hearing in your history class, that you should be, right. that are causing you to think, that are causing you to do a deeper dive. And mm -hmm. that's one of the things I love most about their content is it is a 
It's a push to go, hey, dive deeper into it. Study, you know, let, let's go even deeper. Let's take a look at this. Let's really think about uh, what these events mean and, and what the people were thinking about. And there's an opportunity in some of their videos and stuff that some that I've shown to my students that kind of really got back to the basics of why are we even doing these things? Mm -hmm. We've done the Pledge of Allegiance so long in the classroom, I don't think that these children actually know why we do it. Mm -hmm. So there was a good video with PragerU or one of the former PragerU personalities just did a story read aloud as to why we even have this sure. in the first place. I, I would bet anything that was the first time my students ever heard that. How, how often do we take time to reset on the very consistent ingrained practices we do, reset and remind them or tell them for the first time why we're even doing the Pledge of Allegiance. Why we even reset and have behavior expectations, a reminder of this. Like, why do we do these type of things so that they can own it and feel like they're a part of it? You know, G.K. Chesterton, there's this quote he has where he says, when you come up on a fence, before you tear it down, you want to understand why the fence was built there in the first right. place, right? Like, is, is there, you know, are there animals on the other side? Is there is there a reason why? Well, of course, there was some reason why, right? So you want to understand that before you tear it down. Just as when we start talking about, you see the radical left push for all these dramatic changes of society. And look, we should always be analytical about why we do things. And look, can we do things better? But you also look at some of these traditions that we've had in America, and you want to go, and you want your students to understand, well, why are we doing these yeah. things? Why did people think they were so important? And that's part of why I love studying history myself is, you know, it gives you such context. You know, Churchill said, the further you look back is the further ahead you can see. Mm -hmm. and, and I truly believe that. It gives you incredible context. You get to see so many of the issues we're facing today are not that different than what we're facing. You know, the details might have changed, but so much of what we're dealing with is similar. And so you study it, you think about it, and you really be thoughtful about, like you said, look, why have we always pushed to say the Pledge of Allegiance? Look, why have we protected a minute of prayer to say if you want to pray, you can. If you want to meditate, you can. But you know what? If you want to pray, we want to reserve this minute for you. Right. It's very important that our kids, that our society understand that these were very important in our society because we believe that morality is important, that people's freedom of their religious beliefs is incredibly important. So, hey, we want to encourage you to have religious beliefs if that's what you want. We want you to have that in school. Just like if you don't, we're not going to push you to, but we want to make sure that these are protected in our schools. And when we have this idea of going back and reminding ourselves of why we do some things or dissecting parts of history, like, okay, America had it right here and they had it wrong here. We need to change this and we need to move away. Example, move away from this idea of slavery. That's That was the dark part of our history. What can yeah. we learn from that and build upon? What were the good parts that we want to preserve? Where do we want to conserve something? Where do we want to be progress on from something? And right. when we're having this issue with people trying to rewrite and erase history, the foundation is going to crumble because therefore there's no foundation on anything. And That's we're right. kind of trying to change it to fit and be comfortable with people's feelings. And we're basing things off of feelings instead of science and truth and facts. And our feelings should maybe complement that. You want feelings and emotion to be involved in your reading and being right. being involved in, you know, being creative in the classroom. But right. to put it as the foundation is why we're seeing so many things crumble. Some of the major arguments we're having, liberal versus conservative, logic versus emotion and a lot of things when sure. you really polarize it so much. Yep. No, and and like you said, when you're when you're looking at history, history is history. Okay, it's what happened. You know, and that's what's so frustrating about what the left has tried to do to rewrite it. No, no, you don't rewrite it. You, you understand it. You understand why things happen the way that they did. You try your best to understand the individual. And I always tell my students, you try your best to put yourself in their shoes, right? You really want to judge them appropriately to the time, to what was going on around them, to what they knew. And so you really try to do that because it makes you think. It makes you develop as a human being. It makes you think about decision making it makes you think about what your core principles are and when you do that boy you learn a lot from history you don't only learn you know the dates and times no no you really start to learn about human nature you do humanities and then you can begin to turn it in and assess yourself That's assess right. your own paths of thinking your heritage from your family did i inherit this way of thinking from my parents did, is this something like one of the prager you videos that we had this is in controversy <laughs> is controversial it is talking about how Christopher Columbus was having a discussion with the kids and he was being real, realistic about the reality of the time. Not to justify slavery, but to explain how we could have even gotten to that in the sure. first place. How was this even possible with humanity when we, 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 we have the ability for empathy and for 
uh, pain and suffering. How did society as a culture even get to the point where they became numb to it? And he was trying to highlight that it was a part of the time and the culture was so normalized, kids grew up seeing it normal that they were desensitized to it. That's something we need to hear so we don't run into that problem again. And in fact, we look at what's going on right now we are this idea of like reverse there's no such thing as reverse racism you're right it's just it's just racism and this idea of trying to pinpoint and target people because of their skin color mm-hmm. oppressor and oppressed we could slip back into this problem to some degree if we don't address it and cause address the issue and be teaching people to be critical thinkers and to assess their thought processes and to assess how things change through history so we don't repeat the bad parts and the dark parts of it but there's a push against that completely logical approach to it. Yeah, and, and we, we've seen a state that has started using these classrooms where they segregate the kids yep. based on skin color and put them with a teacher that has the same skin color, only puts them with a, and I'm going, right. It, you don't even have to look that far back, folks. No. Brown versus Board of Education, we tackled this issue of, you know what, when you start separating kids based on their race, mm-hmm. your kids are going, well, why? Is, one race inferior to another. That's the implication when you start going, you can only be with people who look like you. Right. And you just see how quickly we can fall back into the same mistakes if you don't understand history, if you really don't look at it, and you really don't look at that context in order to understand it. So exactly like you said, you don't want to repeat the mistakes if, if possible. You want to study them, you want to understand them, because we constantly want to be analytical and analyzing ourselves as human beings and say, look, we want to live better. We want to give better to our kids. Right. And so we, we got to do that kind of deal. And that practice is teaching children to avoid situations that make you uncomfortable. And discomfort, mm-hmm. if we embrace it correctly, helps us grow. Mm-hmm. Oh, if something doesn't make you feel comfortable, well, you can just have your own classroom with something you feel com- comfortable with. You shouldn't have to embrace the discomfort. The opposite of what parents and teachers should be teaching children right. to be doing because there will not be any development or progression on the individual level and then in a societal level when we're basing things off of emotions, how we currently feel, what doesn't challenge us and put us out of our comfort zone. I mean, the whole basis of education, of stretching your mind and your thinking, and then you can look at it. You can look at it in the spiritual and the mental and the physical. Through discomfort, through strain, through pushing, through working your muscles Mm -hmm. is how we grow and how we become stronger. But we're seeing the pushback on that because we don't like how it makes us feel and we would rather stay comfortable with something. And then we have the weak foundation that we are building all these principles on infiltrating our classroom. That's right. And I even see it with academic achievement. You know, the bar should stay high. You know, we should push kids to learn and to really work hard to right. get good grades. What we've seen over these current year these past few years is this grade inflation, this participation trophy mentality. Right. It all is lowering a bar to say, well, you know, we don't want kids to, you know, to feel bad if they don't make the A. And I'm, yeah. and, but there's something worthwhile of the journey. Uh, of trying your best, of, of the trial and tribulation, of trying to you know do well on a tough test, of memorizing certain things. So you know that's the thing that we've got to get away from is this mentality of look, everybody gets a participation trophy. We never hold kids to standards. We've seen it both academically and with discipline. I hear this all the time. This left wing mindset of you know kids that act up in school. Well, they're just victims, so you just got to treat them like that. No. You tell them that they're they're special, they're unique. You care about them, and here's the bar, here's the expectations for how you act, and and we're gonna make you live up to those expectations. And when you do that, something incredible happens. Kids learn, kids grow, kids want those boundaries, right. kids want expectations. They fight them, but really they want those things. And, and we've got to get back to an education system that believes that. Yeah, in in Oklahoma, you know, being more conservative and having some Christian roots and things and things that we're trying to preserve, but because the the principles that come with them, aspects of even other religions, families that come from, statistically speaking, families that come from a practicing religious home produce successful children. They have more because they have the principles of discipline. And we're, we're seeing, particularly with Christianity and things like that, the topic of separation of church and state. So one thing that you had have been continuing to work on is the religious charter school. Mm-hmm. And I know that's been controversial. Talk about a little bit why that's important to you and then I think it's important for us to address the reality of the meaning and the purpose behind the separation of church and state. Where are we getting it wrong? Where are we getting it right? And things sure. like that. But Yeah, no, I'll start with the religious charter school. You know, uh, I'm very proud that our state is the first in the country to have a religious charter school. And, and you know, and, and the reason for that is, first of all, I believe in the legality of the argument, which is you can't say everyone can start a charter school 
unless you have a religious belief, unless you're a church. Well, if they meet all the criteria for a charter school, and they're, then they can start a charter school. Right. So, so number one, just legality. I, I, I believe that we need to be protecting their First Amendment rights, which says, look, you have the right to free uh, expression of your religious beliefs. So if you want to do this, we're not going to stop you just for that reason, number one. Number two, we have seen religious institutions run some of the most successful schools uh, in the state and in the country. So when they raise their hand and say, you know, we want to start another school and, and we think we could serve even more kids, yep. well, why in the world would we not want that? Number three, I want parents to have as many options in education as possible. I want there to be great religious schools. I want there to be great public schools. I want there to be great um, you know, micro schools. I want yep. there to be great homeschool experiences. I want kids to be able to be aligned to the school that meets their needs the best. And ultimately the purpose of that and something that is a huge Oklahoma value that we see you fighting for and other people fighting for is giving power back to the parents. That's right. So they have the opportunity to choose. That's right. And we see a lot of pushback on the school choice. And one of the popular arguments I hear with coworkers and teachers is, well, the funding is going to shift if they choose another school and all the poor children and families are going to be left at one school and all the more wealthy ones who can afford the transportation and all these other aspects are going to go over to this other school. And then the funding is now lacking in the other school. How would you explain that to someone um, addressing that issue and clarifying on maybe pushing back on that idea or explaining sure. the purpose behind it? Sure. Well, number one, I think we should fund students, not systems. So I believe that when we fund education, we should fund Johnny's education, Susie's education. We shouldn't just dump a lot of money in a school and say, hey, spend it accordingly. No, we should pay you know, $11,000 for Johnny and go, hey, Spend eleven thousand dollars on Johnny. I think that's the way you look at it. I think that's how you make education much more student centric when you view it that way. That being said, if a kid doesn't go to that school anymore, then the money should go with Johnny for where he's going to get educated. But you know, this whole belief that well, you know, all the you know the, the poorer kids will remain and the, and the wealthier kids will leave, and so that's just not what we've seen from other states. You know, we've seen Arizona who've done this for over thirty years. You know what they saw? They saw a lot of kids leave from all socioeconomic classes, left their traditional public school. But you know what they saw after about 10, 15 years? A lot of them came back. A lot of them went to other schools. Why? Because the market started producing change. Public schools started looking at themselves going, what are we doing that's causing these kids to leave? They started offering more programs that were unique for those students. They, they changed leadership. They got administrative costs down and put more money into teacher pay and classroom resources. And then what do you know? The parents a lot of times sent their kids back. We saw the public schools improve. We saw the private schools being able to offer more services for kids. And we saw parents that were happier, that had more options. And by the way, Arizona has the most academic growth for students in poverty than any other state in the country. It worked, and it worked for the poorest of kids in that state. I think that's why we have to have it in Oklahoma. We should always be pushing the, um, the entire country. I want, I want us to lead on this. I want us to have more choice, more options mm -hmm. than any other state in the country. And I think that means, that's why we continue to pursue things like the religious charter school. I want more charter schools in the state. I would like more micro schools in the state. I'm really excited about those where individual teachers can start their own schools. I think all of these op homeschooling, all of these are great options. And again, it's not to do anything negative to the public schools. It will increase and make the public schools um, um, better academically. And one thing that I always think of, and this is just the way that I think maybe on a more practical level or the way that things were made to be in the design behind things. Ultimately, at the end of the day, the authority that was given to the children was their parents. So when we have these options right. of different school choice and different options, it puts power back to the parents. That's right. And I stand firm in the argument that the most important form of government is the family unit. And we see that being attacked on different levels, but with what Oklahoma's doing, with what you're doing in education right now, giving power back to the parents through the option of choice, through their tax dollars coming back to them and giving the opportunity to shift it here or here, giving power back to the parents ultimately is fueling back into the most important form of government, which is the family unit. You know, we need to be seeing more people doing that and trusting that parents are the professionals when it comes yep. to their children. And, and, you know, and I tell my staff this all the time, everything that we do, should be to try to empower the family, strengthen the family, give more options, and give more information to the family. We want families to be tighter. 
We want to encourage it. And not only do we not want to, to stand in the way of it, we want to encourage it. Hey, if we can make, you know, this is one of the things we're looking at right now, can we make budgets more accessible to families? Right. So they're looking at, hey, well, why is the school using money here? Curriculum, we want parents to see what's being taught in schools. Choices, even if it's, hey, go to a different school or even more choices in your own school to go, hey, we want to go to the career tech or we want to be in an internship. We want parents and families to be as close as possible. And if, you, if you're doing your job in education, whether you're a teacher, a principal, a superintendent, you should be looking for ways to get parents more involved in their kids' lives, protecting that unbelievably precious gift that God gave us, which is a family, so that the, these families are tight-knit and, and we're pushing back on, frankly, where society has gone. I mean, you, you asked me about you know, the myth of separation of church and state, my views on that. What we have seen since the 1960s court cases where they just targeted Christians, they targeted religion in schools, and they got this separation that they, that they so desired, the radical left did. Every part of society... Crumbled. Has, has crumbled, absolutely. Look at it since the night. Every statistic you can look at, whether it's drug use, whether it's STDs, whether it's teenage pregnancies, all of these things have gotten dramatically worse. And if you look at a chart, look at it, 1960s, it spikes. It's when we allow the Supreme Court to weaponize the federal government against Christians in our education system. And that's where, look, we, we want Christians to teach in schools. We want kids to pray in schools if that's what they desire. We want our kids to understand the Judeo-Christian values of America and its founding. And all of those things are not negative. They are a part of who we are as a people, who we are as a country. And so protecting religious liberty, making sure that real history is taught is very important to me. Do you see kingdom principles? being involved with government and that's how it should be. I mean, it says, you know, the government will be upon his shoulders. How as the kingdom and wherever you go involved with that, whether it's spoken or not, I mean, I'm a teacher, I'm in the classroom, I don't blatantly speak out those principles, but they're ingrained in me. That's right. And they come out sure. through the character or the way that I would operate in the classroom. That's right. Kingdom principles is something that you see value in, and what would that look like? How does the government and the kingdom operate together the way that it was designed to be? Right, you know, and, and, the, and the wonderful thing about our country is we were founded in a way from our founding fathers where, where they sat there and acknowledged the role faith had. They sat there, and I mean, you see it in the Constitution, you read it in the Declaration of Independence, of the belief that we're endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. It lays it out in the Declaration. You see in the Constitution the protection of religious liberties. You can read the quotes from the founders that believe this was essential. That they, they didn't separate it, right? Hey, when they became, when they were elected president, George Washington, he didn't say, all right, now I'm never talking about God again. I'm in political office, so I'm done with that. No, that's not all what he said. They continued to live their lives as Christians first, and then as government officials. And that's what you see through, thank goodness, that we were founded on those type of values so that as a country, we have those protections in place to say, look, you don't check your religion at the door when, you're, when you enter into a job. You have the protection there to continue that. And that's why I think it's so important for us as a society to go back to those core beliefs and protect them so that our society continues to be able to live in a way that, that, that Christians, hey, you're able to influence the world around you. You're not going to have, wep uh, whether it be um, the government weaponized against you, federal, state, a judge, a, a, a left-wing you know, group of attorneys. You have these protections that are protected in, in a way that's really unique in world history. The church used to actually be the leaders in a lot of things. I mean, Sunday mm -hmm. school, they took on the, the name coming from how the church right. community coming together to educate their youth together. And different aspects, we, we certainly saw Christianity or faith be stronger in the military at different points before it started to dwindle mm -hmm. away. Other government, I mean, the Pledge of Allegiance and all these phrases that we say that are ingrained into us, it has it embedded. These were clearly core principles that meant something. And it was, yep. the government was built upon the church. It wasn't the other way around or this combativeness between the two. Yep. You know, and yeah, they all use the separation of church and state, you know, like, it came from a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptist to say, 
government won't mess with you. Yes. It wasn't the other way around. That would have been insane. No right. one in that time would have looked at it the other way. But he is telling them, look, right. we're not going to try to do anything to your particular religion. And there were, you know, not to go into the whole story, but yeah, but there were concerns there about, well, Jefferson's of a different religious right. b- background. And it was, no, 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 the government's never going to start coming in and interfering with you. And and so, but but what we've seen is that their ability to twist that and to lie about history and to try to weaponize that view against us when in reality, look, morality is incredibly important in our society. And as people of faith, if they follow a moral code, it is imperative that we continue to be a good people. And one thing that you have kind of hit on in a project we're working on here with Red River Creative Media, we're working on a, a documentary about Oklahoma detransitioners, that's former transgenders. Some of these former transgenders that we've interviewed had gotten a lot of the ideology fostered in the classroom. Mm-hmm. Uh, more Oklahoma, one of the detransitioners, had been affirmed by all her teachers except for one, pushing her into that identity. Oklahoma is no exception to this. Certainly it's something that's nationwide. But you hit on gender ideology, and one thing that I want to kind of maybe put a little twist on this and come at it from a different angle, when we think of people who are struggling and suffering with their identity, whether that be their sexual identity, their gender, and questioning who they are, is there, like, what do you think of when we want to address and help those hurting people and a message of hope that could come from children who are being targeted with it or the reality of them actually struggling with their own identity. What's Mm -hmm. a message of hope that the state of Oklahoma puts out to people and not saying like, we don't agree with your ideology to the point where we want you to be cut off and you're not important as a person. That's not the message that we're trying to send. We cannot let it continue, you know, to expand and infiltrate our children. There is a level, there is a a standard that needs to be held for protection. Well, I wonder a conversation we should be having. Also, what resources are we doing to actually help these people come back to their true identity and to be extending a hand to them with boundaries set to where we can also be a resource to see them come back to their true identity. It's a similar thing with the abortion argument. Yes, we need to address and we need to eradicate abortion, but we have to remember that child is a whole person and totally Mm -hmm. important. So is the mother that isn't sure she's ready yet. Mm -hmm. What resources do we offer to the mother and the baby to foster both of them back to the destiny that they have? Similar gender ideology, what extension of hope would you give to someone who is just a young person really actually struggling with that? Absolutely. You know, and, you know, God created all of us in his image. So, you know, you look at that and you look at everyone. I try to, I treat every person with dignity, respect, and know that God loves them. God created them uniquely. And the one thing that I think is so essential in this discussion is, you know, but lying to people who have an issue that you're not loving them by doing that. Now, what you, you asked about help and assistance, one of the things we're trying to work on is, hey, look, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a school counselor, whether you're an administrator, are we noticing every child? Are we actively involved with every child? One of the things we did at the school that I taught at before I left is we identified every single kid and we made sure that, hey, does, that, there's a faculty member, right, that, that does this kid open up to you? Do you at least, do you know the kid? If the kid had a problem, do you think that we'd know? Because it's one of those things you look through kids that, I mean, especially when you get into junior high and high school, kids are changing so much, you know, they're going through a lot of different things. You hear stories about teen suicide and things like that. And mm-hmm. I mean, that, that to me is one of the most heartbreaking things in the world is a young person committing suicide. And so you want to be able to identify these young people and talk to their parents as quickly as possible of, hey, we've noticed some things. Are you noticing them? We want to. Get, we want you involved immediately. We, we've noticed something. You know, maybe a red flag here. We want to talk to you. And so it's really about partnering with their parents to say, listen, in our school, we've noticed this behavior. We've brought it to you first. We want to start. You know, you know, is there resources we can make available to you? Can we start having these conversations? I think it's very important. And, and to your point, what we've seen is schools have actively pushed this. They've actively talked about transgenderism. They've talked about this gender ideology. And so in doing so, what's happened is you have young people who are confused and they, they listen to it and they think that that might be them and they identify with it. And then their lives become a, a huge struggle because right. they're, they're, they're they're trying to be something that they're not. And they're so, fostered into it, most of it despite the parents. And that's the idea. Like we're, 
Where a lot of it comes from is the separation between the child and the parent. When they're mm -hmm. away from them for eight hours, when it's coming in a different ideology from another adult. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is you're actually targeting that and trying to push the parents closer and be more engaged with their children and have someone or have someone who is a resource at the school and an adult that the child can trust and we can be aware of the issue in the first place. Mm -hmm. So really, I think the strategy like you're talking about that we need to be doing this is again, back to the family unit, getting parents engaged, full on attacking this wedge that's being trying to put between the parent and the child. Yeah. The, the classroom is an opportunity to be educated. It's an opportunity for children to be learning and be safe while their parents are at work, but it is not an opportunity to be separating the child from their parents, the most important authority that should have everything said at the end of the day under their their governmental power, the parent. That's right, that's right. And so instead of, and we've seen that, we've seen examples of, of school counselors getting between a parent and their child and keeping things from a parent. Well, it should be the exact opposite. We should be ensuring in our schools that, hey, mom and dad, you know you know what's going on with your kid at school. You, you know every single thing that's going on. We want you to be involved. We want you to be included. And that's how you start correcting and, and making sure that kids are getting the type of uh, you know, treatment they need, help that they need. But what, like you said, what happens so many times is there's that separation right. and that's where the problems really come. And there's this idea when we talk about the opposing side where if, if we are opposing something like gender ideology in school, there's this argument that has been fabricated that, well, that means you're just ignoring them and you're completely ignoring these children and you are in fact harming them by this. Which that couldn't be further from the truth. That's right. I mean. What's hurting them is you lying to them right. and you continuing to send them down a path that you're saying this will make this will help them, that they will feel better if they start identifying as another gender. And then guess what? They go down that road and they find out it doesn't. Right. You know, it, it, it actually, I, don't, I feel worse. Right. And then you want to talk about being distraught. Then you want to talk about the, the um, trauma that, it, that has occurred when, when a young person goes, well, I was told this was the solution to all these issues I was having, and, and it actually, I just made it worse. And you look at some of the chemicals mm -hmm. that people are putting in their bodies at young ages that are very difficult to reverse, and I know that you've done some work with some of those folks where you've heard those stories. It is, it is not helping their mental health. It is not putting them on a path to be successful, and that's where I think you've got to treat kids as individuals, and you don't lie to them. You don't lie to kids. You, the adults are there to help the, ch the children kind of mature and, and deal with these type of problems. But we've got adults that have lied to kids and, and we're just not gonna tolerate it. Ultimately, what we're seeing is this idea, this attack on the family unit. Gender ideology is just one way of doing That's that. That's exactly right. Right, if you convince men they can be women and women they can be men and then start that at the lower level of children, yep. well, you've totally infiltrated the structure in the family unit where you have uh, ideally God and then you have father, mother, and children all equally important in their roles, mm -hmm. being the strong form of government that is put out into society mm -hmm. and then being fruitful, multiplying and creating, going on and creating a society that is fostered by that motive. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing men be put out of place, women be put out of place and targeting children to be put out of place. Ultimately, whether you want to look at this as spiritual or quite in the natural an attack, someone on the outside or even on the inside weakening us. We're really seeing a strategy be, we think that, you know, we there's always these possibilities and people talk about nuclear wars and some attack coming from the outside. The attack is on the inside. It's already in America coming from the inside out, weakening us for if something were to happen on the outside, we would be the target for it. And that's why it's so important for us on the state level to be addressing these Absolutely. issues, to be handling them in the classroom with the students, with the parents, from smallest form of government outward. That's and right. the, outer, the outer forms of government should be the ones with the least amount of power. Yep. Luckily our founders you know, address this and that you know, education is an issue that was left entirely to the states. And we've seen the federal government try to trample that many times. But the reality is, is the states can determine what the schools look like, what's taught, who can teach, things like that. And then what we've pushed for in our state is I want to push as much of that power down to the family. Right. I want to empower the family as much as possible in our education system. So if you if you live by that model, as a state, your policy is push the feds out of their overreach, get the power back in the state where it belongs, and then with your power, you push as much of that down to the family unit. Well, now you're going to be in a much better place when you start looking at how decisions are made for kids. You start looking at an education system that, again, the schools, the teachers should be responding to the families, to the parents. And you start moving back to that model. 
and then you're, you're going to have a much better education system for all kids of all backgrounds. Imagine if we just start looking at the way things were scientifically, the way they were from creation, and right. capitalizing on the way that they were made to be, mm -hmm. on the way that bio biology was set, as if, almost as if a higher power knew what they were doing. Right, right. <laughs> exactly. If we partner with that rather than fight against it, which that's we are right. naturally inclined to fight against it, that's part of our nature too. Sure. But it's amazing if you just look at the basic biology and science. You could put religion aside and we could have this argument here about, well, if we can be scientific about it then if we if you're not a religious family sure. or you don't want to participate in the religious aspect of it. We'll follow the science of it, follow mm -hmm. the biology of it, how the brain development of a child works through time and why mm -hmm. we structure education the way we structure it and why we involve their parents and why bonds are set between mother and child and mm -hmm. father and child and the role of the father and the role of the mother and how they balance each other and one is not more important than the other and the idea of giving power back to the people and giving mm -hmm. power back to the families all based off of the way it was made to be in the first place anyways That's but right. we see everything fighting against that yep in every way yeah i mean you see that you see that from the federal government, you see that from these from these left wing groups, they are fighting to undermine the family. It, it's Marxism at its core. You, you are trying to dissolve the family's influence to try to put the state in the place of family and faith. Mm -hmm. And so, what we should be doing is protecting the family, protecting faith, and then really pushing to say, listen, if you build an education system based on what families' desires are, you protect religious liberty, you get back to the basics in teaching math, reading history and science, real history, and history with an understanding and appreciation for this great country that we live in, yeah. well, now we've gotten first things first. Yeah. You know, you've, you've gone back to that, mo that mode of looking at things, and this is where the alignment has just gotten so far off where we're focusing on these, these you know, social justice issues rather than the things that, frankly, if you went out there, it should cross party lines. And I hear this all the time. I do. I talk to folks, uh, uh, you know, that are Democrats who go, listen, you're right on this, okay? Like, you know, hey, we might agree on everything, but look, our schools have to get back to the focus on what we know to be beneficial for not only for the economy and workforce, but just life in general. These are the basic understandings of, of subject matters that are going to empower you in a way in life that, that's important. And that should speak volumes that we're even having that cross party lines there because we are seeing things become so far left and so far right that they're totally illogical that even people in the middle or who would be on the opposing side of us are like, okay, this is too far. Mm -hmm. We've even seen things with the LGBTQ community with the transgender wave. A lot of people who identify as gay or lesbian are like, okay, I am not on board with this transgender issue. Mm -hmm. This is too far. You're attacking children. You're totally going against science and biology here. The perversion has no limits. I always talk about how there's this scale with perversion and it always wants more. If you think that you can give in to some level of perversion and have just this part and avoid this part, it always wants more. If, you, if you're someone who is uh, struggling with some sort of addiction, if, if you think you can control that and the perversion of it, okay, I'll go this far, but I'll never do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you'd be out of your mind to think that you could somehow control it. But what, what we do see is more and more, it's always more perverse. We see pedophilia trying to be normalized as the next LGBTQIA alphabet changing the verbiage. Minor attracted person, trying to get away from the word pedophile. Mm -hmm. Give it a new label, give it a new name to sensitize people to it mm -hmm. and bring it in and then now trying to attach it to the LGBTQ movement and other aspects of you know, things that I've been through in my own life and um, at some point in my life having even been a former member of the LGBTQ community, something mm -hmm. that I haven't talked too much about lately but we're working on a you know, a short film explaining that process. Mm -hmm. Why am I even making this detransitioner documentary? Well, because mm -hmm. of my own identity struggles and mm -hmm. things I, I saw the danger of and experienced it from childhood all the way to adulthood first time. And I decided I, I have to go back to my principles, my core values, what was important to me, what has been successful in my life, and now in the place that I'm advocating for other people who are now, because now I've seen the dangers of it and experienced mm -hmm. it firsthand. And now I see children being targeted with this. And it was just... We're even we're seeing things being taken so extremely that people are actually waking up to it, mm -hmm. and I think that is one positive thing we're seeing when we have some of this major polarization with things. Ultimately, I want us to be united, yeah. but we are seeing people coming in and playing a role that they have been placed in for this time, shaking things up and waking people just enough so we can be aware of the okay. This is actually bad. This is actually at my doorstep, and I didn't even realize it. We see leaders like Trump. Pe some people can't like 
get on board and is how some are conservative they can't get on board with his personality though there's a there's a certain place in a season at a time where we do need something to get a job done to get us to the next place that's right even if the person doesn't fit your perfect ideal candidate or make you feel nice all the time right and i think we are in a place in a culture and a time and oklahoma is no exception to this and i think again we are going to be the you know the city on a hill the example for other states and i oklahoma is going to be the best that it can be i'm also a big believer i want to see us thrive in other areas. I want us mm -hmm. to be producing our own media, making our own movies, bringing people with values here to Oklahoma so it can be successful so that we can continue our economy, getting that in, and then getting that those finances into the classroom and having more options that ultimately make Oklahoma the best that it can be. And I believe it will be top of all the 50 states. Well, I, I love how you said that because one, one of the things that I think we do so many times when we talk about education is is we almost park it over here. Right, exactly. And, and, and my belief is, no, 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 education touches all of the things. Honestly, education is a pathway for our, our economy to be better, our, our criminal justice system to be better, um, our health to be better, our, our overall our society to be better. Because what you start seeing it is if you view it as, you know, it's part of the community. It's part of growing the community. It's part of driving home what the values of the community are. You start looking at it like that and you go, hold, you know, hold on a second. Education is much bigger than just an educational standard over here or a certificate here. No, no, no. It's much larger than that. It's really the future of what the state can be. And so when I look at it, I look at it through the prism of our state can be a, the leader in the country. Absolutely. But we have to get the education question right. You get that right. You can have these strong societies, you can have strong communities, you can have jobs that are available, and you can have kids that grow up to live a, with a great family where they want to stay here. They want to give back. They want to do things like that. And, and I think that's, that's, that's the future that Oklahomans deserve, and that's a, the future I'm going to continue to try to fight for with all that I can to, for that to be a reality. Absolutely, and I really think that we do need to be not compartmentalizing everything. And... I have found myself ended up working in so many different areas that I wouldn't think I would work in, but ultimately my focus at the end of the day is on the family. So education hits that. Yep. We are struggling with some things, not being a high performing state when it comes to our DHS system in Oklahoma. Some things are going well, some things are not. We have room for growth in that area. When it comes to addressing issues with, with crime and with our prison systems, everything is everything and it starts in the classroom and then it starts in the classroom because it starts with our youth and the classroom should be an extension of the family it should mm -hmm. not be a replacement for the family it should not be free babysitting opportunity the classroom yep. and the teacher my job as an educator as a teacher my job is to reinforce the parents yep. and to reinforce the values of family in the classroom not to take over it not to separate someone from yep. it to be fostering critical thinking to be fostering thinkers who can go out into the world and no matter what they do, if they go on to college, if they go mm -hmm. on to trade school, if they just, if they want to be a mother or if they want to be a father, if that's their objective, to be able to make the individual child feel like, okay, I have learned how to assess, I've learned how to study, I've learned how history has worked, where we've made mistakes and what we've mm -hmm. done right. I can build upon that foundation and I can take that into anything that I do in the future. And yeah. that is what we need to get back to and laser focused with on education. And I am glad that Oklahoma is really started to get there and lead the way on different options, trade schools and yep. college. Sorry. Yes, if you want to go to college. But we really did have this idea idea for a while, like you have to go to college and that's the only option. Yep. And I think we are starting this next generation and it's really the, being the ones that kind of started growing out of that and challenging that. We want college to be a good option for you. Unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of crazy things come out of the universities. Yep. We need to kind of rewrite that as well and set that record straight in the back the way it's supposed to be and we used to get really good things out of the universities yep. <laughs> where they were founded to be, but now yep. we're seeing this transfer and this recruiting coming from the universities and coming from nonprofits and strategically placing teachers in our Oklahoma classrooms. The nonprofits we partner with in Oklahoma are no exception to the, some of the issues that we're facing and being part of the reason for that. But ultimately at the end of the day, tackling all avenues and being united on things here in Oklahoma, I think is what we need to be focused on. I think just humans have this idea of compartmentalizing and sure. fitting what makes us comfortable. And this is the only thing that I can study or commit myself to, otherwise I failed if I yep. care about more than one thing. And I think that we need to be fostering and educating children to be critical thinkers, to be researchers, to be assessors, mm -hmm. and to take that practice no matter what they end up doing.
That's right. You know, I think I think we're on the on the way to get there. I think we've got a long way to go, but I think that we've started putting back um, education in our schools where it should be. I think we've started to to broaden that conversation out about what that means for the whole state. And so, you know, we're going to keep fighting for it. We're going to keep working with families. We're going to keep listening to parents. It's funny, you listen to parents, they tell you. They, they tell you these are the problems, these are the issues. And so we're going to keep working as close with parents as possible and, and keep making that a reality. Yep. I kind of want to hand this torch to you for a second. If there's something on your heart that you feel like you want to share that is important, maybe we didn't hit on, or that you just want to highlight for listeners, you know, there'll be some people from other states, from the nation listening to this, whether it be through the Steamboat Institute and sure. the podcast that they have, or we also are very intentional about, about tying this to Oklahoma and our heart for Oklahoma. The Oklahoma sure. Lion podcast sure. is here to highlight Oklahomans that are doing w- good work, telling their story to other Oklahomans. What would you leave us with? Something that Oklahomans need to know, but really the nation needs to know when it comes to education or family or any of the things we hit on today that are pertinent to our success in the future. Yeah, you know, I, I think there's no substitute for truth. I think that you have to have truth to have unity. Now, so many times you hear folks that want to jump over that and try to find other ways of, of accommodating lies, of, inc- of accommodating indoctrination, ac- accommodating accommodating things that are really never going to lead yeah. to any type of unity. Unity comes through truth. Our schools have to be grounded in truth. That's why we're not going to um, allow the transgender lie to be fostered there. It's why we're not going to allow lies to be fostered about our history. We are going to continue to fight to keep truth in our schools and to keep letting our kids know the truth about America and let the truth know and the truth about themselves, which is you are capable of great things. If you work hard, if you have a vision, if you have a, you know, a, a set of beliefs and you adhere to them, you're capable of great things. And we want our kids to know that. And I think that that's, that that's really, really important, that you ground everything in truth in an education system. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Ryan Walter, so much for being here. I think this is an important topic. And uh, some of the questions and some of the things we hit on, a different side of things that I think we needed to be talking about, it's very relevant. And I think the work that you're doing is great. And I think other people are watching. And I think, again, Oklahoma, because of what you're doing and what other people here are doing in Oklahoma and being united on those issues is going to become a top state in every way. Well, I appreciate it, Gabe. Thank you for the time today. Yeah.